According to a new report from Gallup, there are now more self-identified Republicans than self-identified Democrats in the U.S. This is a little unusual for two reasons. The first reason is that ever since Gallup began tracking party identification three decades ago, in all but a handful of years, significantly more Americans have identified as Democrats or independents who lean Democrat than as Republicans or independents who lean Republican. The current Republican advantage is also unusual because just a year ago at the start of 2021, Democrats actually held a nine percentage point advantage over Republicans in terms of voters party identification. Unfortunately, that sharply reversed over the course of last year. In the fourth quarter of 2021, a surprising 47% of Gallup respondents said they identified as Republican or Republican leaning compared to only 42% that said they identified as Democrats or Democratic leaning. As Gallup noted, Republicans haven't had an advantage this large since early 1995 after winning control of the House of Representatives for the first time since the 1950s. Republicans had a larger advantage only in the first quarter of 1991 after the U.S. victory in the Persian Gulf War led by then-President George H.W. Bush. So to put it bluntly, over the course of Joe Biden's first year in office, the Democratic Party bled support. Why did this happen? A lot of it, of course, is due to the fecklessness, either real or perceived, of the current president. As Gallup notes, changes in party identification generally track presidential approval ratings, and over the course of last year, Biden's ratings plummeted. But let's not let the rest of the Democratic Party off the hook for this drop in party support. As Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders put it recently on Seth Meyers, there's a reason why working class voters in particular have been abandoning the Democratic Party. See, I happen to believe that the Republican success in these red states among working people is not anything that they have done per se. It's not that in red states, people believe in tax breaks for billionaires or throwing millions of people off of health insurance or that people in red states want to do as Mitch McConnell does, cut Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. I think the reason those states have gone red is that people are looking at the Democratic Party and saying, we don't believe you. We don't trust you. You're really not fighting for us. And then there are reasons why they, they go toward the Republicans. So when I go to those states and I say, you know what? You're entitled to decent wages and decent benefits, that health care is a human right, that your kids have a right to go to college, that you shouldn't be ripped off by the pharmaceutical industry. People nod their heads and they say, yeah, you're right, Bernie. No different in those states than in any you know, Vermont or any other state. So I, of course, agree with Senator Sanders. And I would also add, when he talks about Democrats losing working class support, he's really talking about long term trends. But even in the past year alone, Democrats have proven themselves unable or unwilling to fight meaningfully for working people. You might recall that Democrats began the year by pledging to raise the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour, only to quickly jettison that promise after the Senate parliamentarian, an official who holds no actual binding power over the Senate, made some noises of objection. Then of course, congressional Dems managed to destroy their own spending bill, first by eliminating or shaving down popular provisions, including paid family leave, extending the child tax credit, lowering prescription drug prices, free community college and student debt relief. The Congressional Progressive Caucus also quickly signed away any leverage they might have had by striking an incredibly naive deal with Joe Manchin over splitting the bipartisan infrastructure bill from Biden's spending bill, which, as we all know, spectacularly backfired. That all leads me to this. Aside from the spike in self-identified Republicans, there's another troubling part of the recent Gallup report that I think is worth focusing on. It's this trend, a steady increase in the number of self-identified independents. Though independents started to outnumber both Democrats and Republicans in the early 90s, you can see from the graph that the trend has only grown more pronounced over the last decade or so. Back in 1991, the number of Americans who identified as independent was only about three percentage points higher than the number of people who identified as Democrats. In 2021, however, independents led Democrats by a whopping 13 points in terms of party identification. So if we go back to the graph again, we can see that the number of independents really started to grow after 2008. What exactly happened in 2008? Well, Gallup doesn't say specifically, but I think we can hazard a guess. We know that 2008 was the year that the country sank into the Great Recession and millions of families lost homes in the foreclosure crisis. 
According to the LA Times, during the recession, nearly 9 million people lost their jobs, at least 10 million lost their homes. Within four years, 46.5 million Americans were living in poverty. This is John O'Donnell. Single, he works the night shift at a Manchester, New Hampshire hospital. An Air Force veteran, a trained commercial painter, he mops floors to help make ends meet. Hi, John. Hi, how are you? This week, for the first time in his life, he applied for food stamps. I have uh, $3.03 in my pocket, maybe a handful of pennies on my bureau. He's behind on his rent, a diabetic. He spends more on medicine than he does on food. His dinner the day we saw him, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and a cup of coffee. Savings? Nothing. Checking account? Nothing. I have absolutely nothing. Turkey? Yeah. Is that yours? No, it belongs to the gal upstairs. Nothing but his pride, and even that shrinking. Initially, it was tough eating the pride. You know, I mean, I'm 52. I've never been down this road. John O'Donnell is just one of the record number of Americans now living off food stamps, or SNAP as it's called, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. In September, more than 31 million Americans received food stamps, up more than 2 million from the month before. That's one out of every 10 U.S. citizens. A family of four must take home less than $1,800 per month to qualify for food stamps. How bad is it now? What you see now? Oh, this is probably the worst. I've been with the state for 16 years. From New Hampshire to California, the story's the same. More and more families relying on faith-based groups and the federal government to eat. People think of hunger, they think of other countries, but it's right here in your neighborhood. In Louisiana, ravaged yet again by hurricanes this year, the number of people on food stamps jumped 234 percent in September compared to a year ago. In other parts of the country, the numbers are better, but still bad. Idaho, up 24 percent. Florida, almost 24 percent. Nevada, Texas, both above 20 percent. Working class neighborhood. As for John O'Donnell, he's still holding on to his faith. Times will get better. I'm an American, and I believe in God. Like so many Americans, that's all he has left. So here's why this is significant in terms of party identification. Faced with the staggering human cost of the economic crash, what did the Democrats do? They bailed out the banks. As Matt Stoller wrote in the Washington Post, yes, Obama prevented an even greater collapse in 2009, but he also failed to prosecute the banking executives responsible for the housing crisis, then approved a foreclosure wave under the guise of helping homeowners. Though 58% of Americans were in favor of government action to halt foreclosures, Obama's administration balked and voters noticed. By election day in 2016, 75% of voters were looking for someone who could take the country back from the rich and powerful, something unlikely to be done by members of the party that let the financiers behind the 2008 financial crisis walk free. So it's not hard to see how working and middle class voters, particularly those who had supported Obama in two elections on the promise of hope and change, eventually grew disillusioned with the Democrats. Now, at the same time, I don't think that there are many people who actually believe that the Republicans, aka the party of big business and tax cuts for the rich, would have done things differently or extended meaningful help to working people in the aftermath of the crisis. And so after 2008, you get a significant increase in the number of people who identify as independents that is neither as Democrat nor Republican. Now, of course, there's nothing inherently wrong with identifying as an independent. And in fact, if a Gallup pollster called me today, asked me how I identified politically, and then told me my only choices were Republican, Democrat, or independent, I probably also say I was an independent. But this is clearly a problem under our incredibly rigid two-party system and could have long-term ramifications for political participation in the US. As we're staring down a likely Republican sweep in the midterms this year, I think it's worth recalling what happened after the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. That year, as some of you may remember, an unprecedented 45% of union households cast votes for Reagan, and the election is often thought of as the moment that white blue-collar workers fled from the Democrats to the Republicans and never looked back. However, the two election cycles after Reagan's presidency actually tell a slightly different story. 
what appears to have happened after Reagan left office, particularly with regard to the union workers who cast ballots for him, is that the majority of these so-called Reagan Democrats didn't actually become lifelong Republicans. Some went back to casting ballots for Democrats, but more just stopped voting entirely. The point, of course, is that the ongoing failures of the Democrats aren't just creating more Republicans, but are in fact discouraging more and more people from political participation entirely. And unfortunately, when people drop out of the political process, it's very, very difficult to re-engage them. So this is all to say that even if we can't say for sure what might happen in the midterms this year, at least one thing is clear at this point. The Democrats have an incredibly small number of chances left to get it right. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.